Statistics, Dice Central Limit Theorem Example. Get ready and some coffee because it's time to get realistic with statistics. You're not required to, but if you have access to this OneNote file, we're first a word from our sponsor. Yeah, uh, actually we're sponsoring ourselves on this one because apparently the merchandisers, they don't want to be seen with us. But, but that's okay, whatever because our merchandise is, is better than their stupid stuff anyways. Like our, trust me, I'm an accountant product line. Yeah, it's paramount that you let people know that you're an accountant because apparently we're among the only ones equipped with the number crunching skills to answer society's current deep, complex, and nuanced questions. If you would like a commercial free experience, consider subscribing to our website at accountinginstruction.com or accountinginstruction.thinkific.com. Currently in the OneNote presentation section, 1856 Dice Central Limit Theorem Example tab, looking at an example that illustrates the concept of the Central Limit Theorem. The Central Limit Theorem being a central concept to the study of statistics and one which we will apply to many different example problems in future sections or courses. First question, why is the Central Limit Theorem so central to the study of statistics? And note within statistics, you might have noticed, we kind of like that bell-shaped curve. One reason we like it is because with fairly limited information, such as the middle point, the mean of the curve, and the spread, the standard deviation, we can tell a lot about that particular shape because of the qualities of the shape, for example, it being uh, symmetrical. So what we would like to be able to do is say, is there a way that we can get our data into a bell shape so that we can then use the concepts of the bell shape to make approximations about the data sets? Now, some data, as we have seen in prior presentations, has a bell shaped type of curve within the population, but we've also seen that some does not. The data could be skewed to the left, it could be skewed to the right. So for example, if we're talking about, say, measuring the errors that happen, if we're trying to measure stars in the night's sky, and we're trying to say, where's the star gonna be tomorrow, and so on and so forth, it's likely that we're gonna get a data set that hovers around the, the correct point, but it's not exactly at the correct point. You might expect some kind of standard deviation or some kind of bell-shaped curve on that kind of data set. Many things in nature, so we're talking about heights of human beings, the length of a, of, a, of a caterpillar or something like that. You would expect there to be some kind of normal length at a given time or age of whatever it is, and then to have a bell shape around that that would be somewhere around the mean. That would be somewhat normal. But if you do something like roll a dice, then uh, you would expect to have the equal outcomes of the dice one through six to be evenly spread around uh, the outcomes. It's not like like heights that you might say, well, it's going to be around six feet. If you roll the dice, it's not going to be like mostly a four and then spread around. They're all going to be uh, the same. So, so then we can say, well, in many of those things where there is a bell shape, then we might be able to approximate the bell shape to tell us things about that data, which is great. But what about those things where it's not bell shaped or possibly we don't know if it's bell shaped or not because we don't have a big enough sample possibly, you know, to really tell us that information, then what can we do? Well, maybe there's a way that we can use the central limit theorem, basically to take that data and still put it in a format. So it's going to be bell shaped possibly by taking averages. And that's the concept that we want to be looking into here. All right. So first, let's just let's just take our dice example here. So as we think about our dice example, you could think about the idea that we have one dice, two dice, and then basically up to an uh, infinite number of dice. So you can kind of think about like the population as an infinite number of dice, for example, and, and we're picking one dice and then two dice and then so on. So let's just think about what happens to the data as we add dice, and then we'll think about the average information uh, as we add dice. So if we have a dice, there's six sides to the dice. What are the odds of the dice, any of those sides coming up? There's a 1-6 odds for each of them, which is 16.67%. 
which adds up to 100%. So the odds of getting a one, one out of six, 16.7%. The odds of giving a two is one out of six, 16.7, and so on uh, and so forth. If we were to graph a histogram, then we're going to have basically a uniform uh, distribution of that data to get a uh, one, two, three, four, five, or six. We have basically even odds uh, to get any of those numbers. What if we had two dice though? So now we're saying, I'm not going to take the average of the two dice. We'll get to that later, but let's just think about what happens if I just add another die. So now I have a red die and I have a black die. And let's think about all the types of outcomes that could come up. Now, if you have one dice, you can only get six numbers. But if you have two dice, then you can get, you know, 12 could be the maximum uh, number. So, so, and then how many combinations could there be if there were two dice? Well, we have six times six, there should be 36 combinations. Gets a little bit wonky to map out those combinations though, because we don't have a, an even chance to get any one of these numbers. Notice if you have two dice, you can't get a zero, of course, if you roll two dice. You can't even get a one because you have two dice, the lowest you can get is a two. And then you could you can get a you can get a two and a one, you can get a three and a one, a four and a one, a five and a one, a six and a one. And then and then you can also, if I say the second dice is all twos, you can get a two and a one, a two and a two, a two and a three, a two and a four. Notice I'm counting it as a separate uh, roll. It's different the way I'm counting it to get a red die two, black die one, and a a black die two and a red die one. So there's so those are being counted distinctly, and those are things we have to kind of consider or take into consideration when we're looking at different kind of uh, games, for example. And if I if I do this all the way down, all the threes can have each of the ones, all of the fours, all of the fives, all of the six. If I add them up, 36 chances, and you can see the numbers. If I add these numbers up, six and six, uh, six and five, they're going to give us the total outcomes. Now these outcomes are not evenly. You don't have an, a same chance to get a two as you do like an eight, for example. So we can do the, the good old uh, table over here and say, well, let's say, what are my chances that I can get? What are the things I could roll? I can roll anything from uh, not a one, I can roll a two up to 12. So one is gonna have zero, right? There's a count, zero ones. The twos I can roll, there's only one way to roll uh, a two because you have, they both have to be a one. The, to get a three, you can have a two or a one or a one or a two to either die, right? A four, there's three raised to roll a four, four raised to roll a five, and five raised to roll a six, seven or six ways to roll a seven. I think I'm losing my R's there and so on and so forth. And that adds up to the count of 36. So out of the 36 different combinations, the most likely outcome that we're going to get is basically the seven right out of the two dice 7 11 7 11. so if we look at the percentages then we're going to say all right if i look at each of these percentages we have one out of 36 is 2.78 about we've got this one which is two out of 36 which is 5.56 about three out of 36 is about uh, uh, 8.33 and so on uh, and so forth. So if what if I was to basically uh, graph that, I've basically what I've done here is I've graphed now 12, the numbers could be one through 12 for the two dice in blue. And you can see it's starting to approximate more of a bell shape. Now, it's not a perfect comparison. I can't compare these two sets of numbers that easily because obviously I'm counting up the total numbers to 12 here. Whereas before I was counting just uh, the one dice versus the two dice. I've also put, try to e equivalent these two so we can see the difference in the shape. The way I did that is to say, okay, let's look at what we had before with one dice. The chances are one sixth. Here's the percent odds. And then I just said, okay, let's try to make it the percents the same as though we rolled it like two times, right? So we have out of 36 chances, we have the same odds of 0.1667. It's about six, right? And so then that's going to be six all the way down. So I'm showing a, a uniform distribution, not at one, but at six, 
So it's mirroring this distribution, but it's out of 36. So we can kind of just compare the shape uh, of the graphs. Now, if we continued this, we can say, all right, this is interesting. It, the shape is, is changing the way we like it. I don't know exactly how we're going to equivalent those two things, possibly. We know we're going to use the average, but, but uh, right now we're not to that part of the story yet. So then we're going to say, okay, let me say what would happen if we had three dice, orange, red, black, and then we sum up those. Now, if you were to do this, we do this in Excel, so you can, in, in a future, in a different course or section, if you want to check that out. Uh, but obviously, uh, the combinations would be six times uh, six times six, or uh, 216. And uh, if we map it out, we can say, all right, here's the orange die. I'm, I copied everything I had before, all the different combinations of the two die, could be a one and then all of those different combinations. And then you could just copy all of those combinations and add the new die with a two and all of those different combinations. And then with a three and then with a four. So it's a lot of different combos, but you can actually do it in Excel if you do it systematically fairly easily. It comes out to 216. There's our check number, six cubed. And then I can take my count. Here's my sum. And of course, the highest number that we can get to now would be to be to have all three dies be six, six times uh, three, which would be 18. So if I map out our number here, we're going to say, give me one up to 18. That's as high as we can go. And then count all of the different combos to get a one. You can't get a one. You can't get a two. The lowest number you can get a three, which is three ones. Only one way to do that. All three dice has a one. There's three ways to get a four, six ways to get a five, 10 ways to get a six, 15 ways to get a seven, uh, 21 ways to get an eight, and so on and so forth. Now, if I plot this out, then we can see with the three die, we're getting this, again, more of a bell-shaped nice curve, and it's becoming more of a spread out uh, kind of curve because we have the larger number up here. I've put this in equivalent numbers to the other two. How did I do that? We basically just took the last ones that we did, looked at the percent of the total. So I so I took all of these and said, this is one out of uh, 36 is 2.78. And this is two out of 36 is that. And then I multiply times the total we want now, which is 216. So I'm using the same percentages. So I'm going to say 216 times the uh, 0.078, hold on a sec, 216 times 0.0278 gives us the six, right? And then 216 times this one, 0.0556 gives us 12 and so on and so forth. And then I did the same for the one die. So now I took the 216 times the percent, 216 times the point oh, uh, sorry, point 0.1667 gives us the 36. So that we can see basically concentrate on the shape of the die and it's getting more flat and spread out versus a bit more peaked here. And then we have that uniform distribution that we started with. All right, let's do the next one. So now we're gonna say four die and it's getting a bit repetitive i think we're seeing the pattern here so we'll do this a little bit faster but the idea of course would be now we have a yellow orange red black die now to do this in excel i could just copy all the stuff i had before and say that could happen with the yellow die being a one and then copy all the stuff i had before and it would be a two i didn't copy it all the way down because it would be very long but we do that in excel if you want to see that pattern and then we get all the totals down here and if we add that up now we're going to say you can't get a one, you can't get a two, you can't get a three. The lowest number you can get is a four, and that can only happen one way. All dice, four dice are fours, right? And then there's there's four ways to get a five, six ways to get a six, and so on and so forth. There's 400, 146 ways to get a 14, and then it goes back down. Total outcome is one, two, nine, six, which there's six times six times six times six, or six cubed one two nine six options and these are all the numbers broken out so if we were then to map that out 
same idea. So now we've we've equalized the curves again. So they're, they're the same kind of area under the curve. This one is more spread out now because it's going out to 24. Here's this one, and then this one, and then, and then this one. And let's do one more. We're going to go to the five dice. So now we're going to say, okay, five dice, green, yellow, orange, red. And we did the same kind of combination concept. And if I was to count all the outcomes, now we have five dies, which would be six times six times six times six times six, which would be 7,776 total outcomes. And the lowest number that we can get is a five, all of the dies being a one, only one way to do that. And we have what 780 ways that we can get a 17 or an 18. If we map this out, we can see what's happening with the curve. So now we have these curves, once again, being somewhat equalized uh, as we saw before, and they're getting to be more spread out. So that's great. Uh, so now the question is, well, uh, if, if I was to measure like heights or something like that, it's not like I want to measure the first person was six feet and I say he's six feet and then the second person is going to be five feet and I'm going to add the totals up for example what so so how can I make this useful I can say well does it does that same concept apply if we do multiple different samples and we take the average I mean if we take the average of the outcomes right so now now we'll take the average of the outcomes so let's say then we have our data with uh, the red and the black die it sums up to two. So now we're back to two dice. These are all the different combinations with two dice. It sums up to two, but now we're looking at the average. And of course the average would be one plus one divided by two dice or one. The average uh, down here would be four plus two gives us the six divided by two dice is an average of three. Now, I saw this explained one time uh, with the example of, of like if you're at a gas station and, and you can and you're going to imagine when you go to the gas station, instead of them just giving you a price, you roll a dice. Right. And if you get whatever the number on the dice comes up, that's how much you pay for gas. So you could pay one dollar, two dollars up to six dollars for the gas on whatever you roll the dice from. And so if you if you if you roll one dice. You have you have what odds do you have to get you have even odds to pay one through through six dollars but if you roll two dice and then take the average of the two dice then then you still have the possibility to pay more or less but what happens to the odds if you basically roll two dice if you take the average now these are the bends that i'm going to do to do a, a frequency distribution because now the averages you'll note do not come out to whole numbers. So, uh, so I can't just use a count function to say, give me all the ones, all the twos, all the threes, because there are decimals involved here. So if I go over here and say, okay, let me, let me then uh, make the, the ends of the bends and then the frequency count. So now I'm using a frequency calculation to calculate the ends of the bends to help me group, uh, group the the ones and twos and threes because there are decimals involved in it so now we're saying we have about uh one on the ones uh five on the twos we have five uh twos and then nine we have uh, the three and then with the four we have 11 uh on the four and so on and so forth so if I was to map this out, now we're taking the averages and notice you're getting a similar kind of concept here, meaning now we're taking the, the average information and it's going, here's basically the, the equivalent of the one dice situation where you have even odds to get to pay one, two, three or four, five or six dollars for your gas. And then here you still have one, two, three, four, five and six, but it's starting to cluster more towards that middle point. So when we do the average, notice what's happening. It's starting to take that bell-shaped curve, even though the original was was not uh, bell-shaped, and uh, it's starting to get more peaked towards basically that middle point, basically the mean point, right? And if we continue this exercise, so now we take three dice. 
sum it up and give us the average. So here's the sum column of the three ties. And then now we're taking the, the average uh, of them. And so what's gonna happen here, if I go back on over, we're gonna say, okay. So now here's my bins and my frequency. I'm still gonna keep the categories at the, 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 the bins at one, two to six. I could change them to like decimals and whatnot, but I'm gonna keep them at, at uh, one through six. And then here's my frequency distribution on the averages. The one is a one, the two, uh, 19, the three, 61, the four, uh, the 79, and so on and so forth. And I did, you know, an equivalent kind of equalizing calculation down here so that I can put them on my graphs for the one die, the two die, and the three die. And so now we have the three. Here's the three die. It's getting more peaked uh, towards that. Uh, middle point that you can see which is actually going to be the uh, 3.5 which you can't which isn't here because we took our bins at one two three four and five so it's a little bit warped because because I'm keeping just the one two three four five but the idea is it's getting more peaked here uh, and it's getting it should be like more bell shaped it's actually becoming uh, more peaked towards that middle points which is going to be the mean of the 3.5 and so if we look at those calculations here, we could say here's the mean uh, of, of uh, here's the mean calculation of one, and here's the standard deviation of the one. So it's at the 3.5. When we go to two dice, the mean is at 3.5 still, that's the average, but the standard deviation is 1.22. It's becoming less spread out. It's becoming more the, impacted towards the mean and then with three dice the the mean or average is still of course 3.5 but it's becoming more peaked in essence towards that middle point of the 3.5 which you can kind of see on the graph but it's a little wonky given the fact that that uh, we didn't we don't have 3.5 there we're still using the one through six on uh, the data now here's basically uh, a histogram just uh, that, that we that we generated from uh, the data that has I and I chose different bin links by basically just creating the histogram and adjusting the bin links and you could see uh, the, the 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 difference in the in the categories of the bins here for the shape of the curve and then let's go up to the next one and say all right we see the patterns happening here for four dice one two three four die now and so we're going to say okay here's our bends here's our frequency distribution for all of the averages uh, uh, of them again we're just keeping the bends at one through six even though we have the decimals here which gives us a graph that's a little bit wonky but kind of gives us the point that on four dice it's becoming more peaked and it would be more bell shaped it would be smoother if i had larger uh, or more detailed numbers down here, but you get the idea of what's happening. There's the four, there's the three, there's the two, and there's the one, and they've been kind of equalized uh, in a similar fashion as we did uh, before when we weren't doing the averages. Here's my means, mean of one die, mean of two die, mean of three die. What's happening to the standard deviation? The standard deviation being the calculation measuring the spread, the larger the standard deviation, the larger the spread of the data, the wider it's going to be, the standard deviation is getting less. So if you're going to a gas station and you have to, and you're gonna roll a dice, if you go to the gas station that has four die, then you're more likely to pay something closer to the middle point, the 3.5, than if you go to a gas station that only what rolls one dice, which you have basically even odds to, to pay the one through six. So you could get lucky and pay one, at that gas station, but you also could get unlucky and hit a six. Whereas if you take the average of the four dice, then it's more likely that you're gonna pay somewhere in the middle of uh, the, the, the 3.5 on the average. Now here's the histogram that we took and we have the bins that are a bit more spread out and you can see it's a nice more smooth uh, data with, with that bin set uh, that we calculate that way. And then of course, let's do the last one with five dies. So now we have the five die, boom, boom, boom. Here's the sum. Here's my bends. I'm still keeping the bends uh, one through six. Frequency distribution to calculate it. And so now we have the five die. Once again, it gets more peaked versus the four die versus the three die 
versus the two die versus the one die. So of course with the five die gas station, you roll five dice and take the average and that's what you pay. It's gonna be a lot more likely that you hit that middle point of the 3.5. Here's the standard deviation. So once again, the mean is the same and you're getting this standard uh, deviation is getting smaller. It's being more packed around the mean. And then here's the histogram with, with different bucket sizes that you could see a nice, beautiful looking more bell shape. So that's gonna be, so the idea then would be from a statistical sampling situation, which is where this comes up a lot of the time, is we have a bunch of questions that could come up about a statistical sample. So if we're trying to test something, then we might not know whether, we might not even know if, it's, if, if the total population is bell-shaped or not because we haven't been able to test that possibly. We might not know the mean of the total population. We might not know the standard deviation of the total population, uh, uh, for example, and we might have different techniques then to tell us about that data if we know different things about the data. So for example, if the data is bell-shaped and we, we have an idea that the total population should be bell-shaped or a sense that it is bell-shaped, then we might be able to, to, to treat that data as approximating a bell shape. If it's not bell shaped, then the question is, well, can we take multiple samples possibly uh, to, so that it will, so that the averages will basically approximate a bell shape, which means that we can still possibly use these same kind of concepts, uh, even though we have a data set uh, that is not, the actual data is not bell shaped, right? But using the central limit theorem, we might be able to, to use the similar concepts. So those are the questions that come up later when we start to apply, especially with like testing, sample testing. Uh, how, how can we apply this concept to make full use of this beautiful bell-shaped shape? How can we put the data in a format that we can extract meaning from it as much as possible? And again, the central limit theorem could be core to that as we will see in applications in future presentations.